Now, as I told you on Tuesday, we have a real treat today. Uh, we have Professor Russell Korobkin from the UCLA Law School. And like all of the guest speakers that you've had, I have to practically beg because their schedules are so busy in terms of being able to get them to come to class, so it's a real privilege. Uh, Professor Korobkin is a, a remarkable legal scholar, and as I told you, he's uh, a specialist in uh, healthcare law, among other things, and contracts, and he wrote a book, The Stem Cell Century, which I showed you and talked to you about on Tuesday, discussing stem cells with respect to legal aspects and ethics and things like that. Uh, he's been at UCLA since 2001, so I told him today that I consider him uh, a relative youngster, you know, since I've been here since 1976, so mm -hmm. there's quite a distance in between that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, he got his bachelor's and his law degree from Stanford, who I believe are playing in basketball tonight uh, up in Palo Alto. So, um, and in those days, they probably had a fabulous basketball team, real rivalry between UCLA and Stanford in those days. Sad to say, Bob, I am old enough that when I was at Stanford, the basketball team was not very good. Oh, my God. The, 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 the golden days were after I left After. Mm. Well, the golden days were when I came here in 1976 and tried to get season tickets to the Bruins, you can imagine that I couldn't do it because it was the year John Wooten retired and there wasn't a season ticket to be bought. In any case, uh, Russell's going to talk to us today about stem cells, ethics, and legal issues. He's going to uh, go over uh, aspect, legal aspects of, uh, with respect to patenting and other things with respect to stem cells uh, on Tuesday of next week. I won't be going over the same ground, but we'll be talking about legal aspects of science as it pertains to the Constitution. And then we'll pick up the week after that on... Uh, patents and things like that. And so I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Russell. And well, thank you for um, begging me to come today, Bob. Uh, uh, <laughs> it, it is true that um, I, I'm sure uh, the people Bob tries to get to come and speak to the class, it's always uh, difficult to get someone to find a, an opening in their schedule and be willing to commit the time to preparing. And uh, I get uh, these kind of invitations from time to time. And so I quickly did a little research because uh, there are, you know, there are some professors who are looking for guest lecturers to come to their class just because it saves them a little bit of time that they don't have to spend in preparation. And um, so I did a little bit of research and I said, oh my goodness, that is not what's going on in this class. This guy is, as I'm sure you all know, is the Tasmanian devil of activity. Um, so it, it's a... Um, so I said, well, if he can do all the stuff that he's doing, I think I can squeeze in uh, uh, one afternoon to participate. So thank you for having me. Um, le so let me just tell you a little bit how I got in, uh, involved with uh, stem cell uh, research policy. Um, it was really by accident, which I guess is uh, maybe a life lesson. Uh, you know, probably what you'll end up spending many years of your lives on down the road will probably turn out to be somewhat of an accident in the way this was. Uh, about, I guess it's been about four years now, four or five years, something like that, uh, the UCLA Center for Society and Genetics was putting on an interdisciplinary conference on stem cells. And uh, they came to the law school looking for someone who was an expert on legal issues in stem cells who would come and speak at this conference. And uh, my dean uh, told them that he, he didn't have anybody on the faculty that knew anything about stem cells, but maybe they would like to talk to me because I uh, teach and write in the area of healthcare law, which obviously bears some relationship, but it's not, uh, you know, not an exact match by any means. So uh, they asked me if I would speak at this conference. And you know, kind of the same way I agreed to come and give the lecture here today, I did a little research and I said, these guys really, they're serious people, they work hard. Uh, I should be able to make the time to give a talk at this conference. And I thought that it was an interesting issue. I didn't know anything about stem cells, but I thought it wouldn't be bad to just do a little bit of reading. I didn't think it would take me a lot of time. Uh, maybe I would find a book that talked about all the different legal issues related to stem cells. I'd read it. I'd get up on my hind legs uh, and uh, give a talk for 15 or 20 minutes, and it wouldn't be any big deal. Uh, and so I agreed to do it, and then I found out that there was no such book that I thought I would just uh, easily read. 
Um, there was no anything that really sort of covered the waterfront of the range of legal and policy issues involved uh, with stem cells. Now, some of those issues get a lot of play in the newspaper, and you know, uh, certainly there are some of them that get written about from time to time in the scholarly literature. But a lot of them uh, were not written about at all, and there was very little uh, scholarly work uh, done on them at, at all. So. In preparing to give this talk, I ended up having to do a lot of research on a lot of different things. And then when I was done getting ready for the talk, I had a fairly significant paper. And so then I started to think, well, maybe this would actually be better as a book than a paper. And so I talked to an editor uh, at the Yale University Press. And he said, well, send me a copy of the paper. I'll tell you what I think, if it would make a good book. So I sent it to him. And he said, yeah, this would be a great book. Let's do it as a book. So that added on another year and a half to my study of stem cells, because of course there was a lot to do between making it going from a paper to a book. So um, then uh, the book came out uh, about uh, 15 months ago, I guess, about November of 2007. And uh, unfortunately for, uh, for yours truly, there were a lot of big developments that hit right around that time that the book came out. So in a sense, I kind of felt like the book was out of date the minute it hit the bookstores. I knew with stem cells, you know, stem cells is a topic that you can't expect a book to stay current for very long. But I did think it might at least enjoy a month or two while still being uh, up to date. But it really didn't even, uh, didn't even get that far. So my next uh, stem cell project was to write an article uh, on the um, on the impact of the things that happened after the book was published, sort of the, uh, the relevance or importance of things that happened after that. And so that's what I'm going to talk mostly about today, is the, this article, which, um, or the t at least the topics in this article that was just published uh, last month. Um, so that's why the talk is called Recent Developments in the Stem Cell Century. So just to give you a sense of where this fits into the, the waterfront, here's the, here's the book, which, by the way, is now out in paper. So if you want to read it, you can save 10 bucks. Um, and here are the topics that are covered in the book. And like I said, what the, the idea of the book was to try to cover all the different legal issues and try to critically assess what the issues were and then try to come to some kind of resolution of the issues, what I think the right legal or policy answers were to the important issues. Um, and uh, so it covered these uh, uh, really sort of eight separate sets of topics sandwiched between an introduction uh, that gives a little bit of the scientific background, the sort of the basic science that you need only so far as you need to know to understand the policy issues, um, and the conclusion at the end. So what I'm really going to be talking about today focuses on sort of updating what's in chapters 2, 4, and 7 based on developments that occurred, as I said, after the book was published. So uh, the three things I want to talk about are um, the question of whether or not research on human embryonic stem cells ought to be uh, regulated, uh, ought to be uh, permitted, ought to be allowed. Uh, then I'm going to talk about, I'm gonna, uh, the, the order of the talk goes, then I'm going to skip down to uh, some interesting uh, issues about uh, whether we should allow people to sell tissues for not just stem cell research, although that's obviously that's an important field, but it's a bigger issue than that, whether people should be able to sell tissues for biomedical research. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to talk about, for reasons that you'll see, I'm going to focus on the question of whether uh, the, the law should permit women to sell eggs for, uh, for research purposes. And I, I'm told that you just talked about um, uh, in vitro fertilization uh, last week. So um, I, I assume maybe this issue came up of compensation of, uh, of egg donors. And so it's a, a similar issue here. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, some interesting um, uh, sort of an update on some things that are uh, happening in a very, very complicated and difficult legal question of whether we should allow people to obtain patents on stem cells themselves. So those are the three topics that I'm going to talk about. And uh, along the way, if you want to uh, ask questions or make comments as we're going, feel free. Um, I guess Bob says we have up to two and a half hours. I certainly don't have two and a half hours worth of talking to do. So uh, you know, whatever you guys want to bring up. Ask uh, a lot of questions. <laughs> OK. Um, now, let me just go over uh, some technology here, which I'm told that you guys know all about this, uh, uh, all about the science here. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, just a couple of seconds. OK, so um, uh, human embryonic stem cells, OK, 
okay, uh, are, um, uh, we get human embryonic stem cells for embryonic stem cell research by harvesting the inner cell mass from five-day-old embryos, also called blastocysts. Oops, pointing this the wrong way. Um, now, <clears throat> why is this important for science, right? Why don't we just use uh, adult stem cells that come from tissues in, our, in, our bo in the bodies of fetuses or um, of, uh, of people? Um, <clears throat> Embryonic stem cells uh, can create all cell types. This is the, this is the uh, argument that you usually see in the newspaper, right? Why do we need embryonic stem cells when there's all this controversy about using embryos? Uh, why not just use stem cells that we have in our body that replaced uh, dead or damaged uh, adult cells? Uh, why don't we use adult stem cells? So the, the newspaper answer is that, well, embryonic stem cells can create all kinds of cells. They can be differentiated into all the different cells in the body, whereas adults, each different type of adult stem cells are limited to a certain uh, type of cell that they can create. This is, I think, an entirely unsatisfactory answer because who cares for the purpose of curing diseases whether you can use one embryonic stem cell to make all the different kinds of cells or whether you need lots of different kinds of adult stem cells to make all the different kinds of cells. There's no uh, obvious reason why you need only one kind of cell when you can use different adult stem cells. So, um, one, so one answer to the question is that there are some type of adult cells that we don't think there are adult stem cells for. Right? We don't think that there are adult stem cells that make those type of cells. And it might just be that scientists haven't been able to find them yet. But for whatever reason, we don't think we can make those out of adult stem cells. We think we need embryonic stem cells. Um, but that's also only a partially satisfactory answer because there are lots of type of cells that we do have uh, adult. We know how to find adult stem cells. Uh, and we can presumably, in the same way we might be able to one day use embryonic stem cells to make replacements for dead or damaged cells, we could use the adult stem cells to make replacements. And I think the most um, satisfying answer to this question is that um, uh, embryonic stem cells compared to adult stem cells proliferate very rapidly in culture, much more rapidly, and say, stay stable, stable over uh, far longer periods of time. So uh, most scientists think that they're a lot useful than, a lot, a lot more useful uh, for those reasons than adult stem cells. So that's the primary, sor primary source of cells for stem cell research, right? At least that's what scientists will think, think in the long run are going to be, uh, or at least until last year, thought were going to be the most useful type of uh, stem cells for um, understanding disease and then for possibly creating treatments to disease sometime in the future. Um, <clears throat> SCNT, is this an abbreviation that's familiar to you guys? Somatic cell nuclear transfer? Okay, because you've talked about cloning. Okay, so, um, so another uh, type of technology that stem cell scientists uh, are using is uh, SCNT, or sometimes called therapeutic cloning, right? The idea with uh, therapeutic cloning is that you take the nucleus from an adult cell, you insert it uh, into an egg, you do the magic to get it to uh, um, start to, uh, to uh, make the, um, uh, the zygote, uh, or what looks like a zygote, divide. Uh, and then it starts acting like an embryo. And then in five days, you grab it and you harvest the inner cell mass from that, just like you would from, uh, an, from an embryo that's created in the, uh, in the regular way using a sperm cell and an egg cell. Um, uh, what's the benefit of this technology? Well, if scientists are able to get this technology to work in people, which they haven't been able to yet, um, there's the possibility of creating disease-specific cell lines, right? So you could actually manufacture a cell line that you know has the nucleus uh, uh, of a cell from someone that has Parkinson's disease, right, or has some other kind of disease. Uh, and you could potentially make patient-specific treatments. Right, so if you had uh, Parkinson's disease, we could potentially take one of your cells and use that, use the therapeutic cloning technology to make a cell line that comes from the cells in your body. And then we could use those cells uh, as treatment for your illness. And the great thing about patient-specific cell lines is you don't have to worry about, um, uh, about them being rejected because um, of the uh, uh, incompatibility of the cells by the patient. 
So when the book came out, this was basically the type of technologies that we were mostly talking about. Uh, then right at the time that my book came out, November of 2007, we had the announcement that scientists had just created iPSCs, or induced pluripotent stem cells, using human cells. Um, two labs, one uh, in the United States and one in Japan, announced uh, their ability to do this on the same day. Uh, and what these are is they, uh, they are reprogrammed adult cells. Okay? So they're not adult stem cells, right? Make sure that that distinction is clear. You can make an induced pluripotent cell by just taking any old adult, adult cell. Right? It doesn't have to be an adult stem cell. Take a, a skin cell uh, from, your, uh, from your hand. Uh, and they can be reprogrammed. Scientists have figured out how to reprogram these cells by inserting uh, four new genes. Uh, for inserting, inserting four genes into, this, into these uh, cells to cause the cells to then start behaving like embryonic stem cells. It's like it takes the, it reprograms them to take them back in time to behave like embryonic stem cells. And now scientists have been able to uh, figure out how to, after these cells are reprogrammed, to differentiate them into lots of specific cell types, uh, much in the same way of embryonic stem cells. Um, the problem, uh, one, pro uh, one problem is that uh, so far, at least, they've been using retroviruses in order to introduce these uh, genes to the cells, which has the potential of, uh, of uh, creating a cancer risk. But there's a lot of very, I think, far along research now, and this is something uh, Bob can, will know more about than I am, but the research is moving very fast now at finding ways to uh, potentially do this without retroviruses. Bob? This is very similar to what I talked about on Tuesday. They're using retroviruses in terms of vectors for genetic engineering. And in this situation, they use the vet retroviruses to introduce four genes. And those genes encode transcription factors that we've talked about. And those transcription factors are able to interact with different switches in these adult cells and then reprogram them, essentially, uh, to become uh, embryonic stem cells. So it's the same technology of genetic engineering, uh, turning on switches, turning off, and. Uh, that we've been talking about the entire quarter. Right, exactly what it, right, exactly what it is, genetic engineering, right? Um, reprogramming them to be like uh, embryonic stem cells. Now, the great thing about um, iPSCs, well, one, one nice thing about them is you don't need any embryos. So uh, you, by doing research with iPSCs, you avoid a lot of the uh, ethical um, uh, complications of using embryos to create stem cells. And you also have, aside from that, which is a nice benefit, but you have this great benefit that, like scientists have hoped to do with therapeutic cloning, with iPSCs you have the potential of someday using stem cell technology to create sp patient-specific treatments, right? So you don't have to worry about HLA incompatibility. Okay, so that's some of the background technology. And I want to I first talk about why I think iPSCs have changed or will or should change or will change uh, the legal landscape when we're talking about regulation of uh, embryonic stem cell technology. But before we do that, I was encouraged to use this great uh, technology that you have that I do not have um, at the law school, so this is new for me, to get your opinion about this uh, question here. So I think there are three dominant views about the moral value of five-day-old embryos, that is, the blastocysts that are used and are destroyed in the process of creating embryonic stem cell lines for stem cell research. Right? So I want to get a sense from you guys of which of the following three, moral, three views most closely reflects your own uh, view about the moral value of blastocysts. Okay? So choice A is blastocysts has the same moral value as persons. By this I mean by persons, I mean someone who's, who uh, uh, after they have been born, right? Um, blastocysts have the same moral value of persons, and therefore we should not do anything to a blastocyst that we should, would not do to a person, okay? This is one um, uh, belief about the moral value of embryos. Uh, the second is that blastocysts have no more moral value than any other small clump of human cells. So if, we're, uh, if we feel comfortable doing research on any kind of tissue sample, right? Let's say you took a swab of skin cells uh, from a person. If we thought it's OK to do research using those cells, then we ought to feel perfectly comfortable about using 
uh, blastocyst for research as well. It's kind of the other, the other uh, uh, polar opposite of A. Uh, and then C is the uh, intermediate value, or sometimes called the special respect uh, view, that blastocysts have an intermediate amount of moral value. They're less valuable than persons, but they're more valuable than uh, other clumps of cells, right? other pieces of tissue. And therefore, um, we, should, um, uh, we should treat them accordingly. right? We, we owe them a special respect uh, that we don't owe most other types of tissues. So now I'm supposed to press, I, do I press this? Or? Oh, I have to do the mouse? Is the mouse up here? OK. OK, so you got the three choices. There you go. OK. I feel like I should be humming the Jeopardy music here. OK, stop. They voted. They've all voted. OK. All right. Stop. Stop. Display. Display. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, it's a pretty liberal class here. Okay, interesting. All right. So a lot of, so mostly Bs, not very many Cs. Okay. So who said uh, one moral value? Kayla, take the microphone and tell us why. <laughs> okay. Um, I am, I am pro-life and it fits in the same category. I think that um, that an embryo with a new type of DNA is a new person. And okay. therefore, we do not have the right okay. to kill that being. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about you, Faria? How did you vote? I Up in Davis. B. And what's your reason for B? It's just a, like any other clump of cells. Uh, I voted C, actually. You voted C, okay. Yeah. We'll come back to you. Who mm -hmm. voted B? Lauren, hit me. For me, a five-day-old embryo has doesn't represent a human at all. I mean, it, it doesn't can't think. It doesn't have. It doesn't look like a human. It just mm -hmm. it doesn't seem human to me. It's just who really else a said B? Stephen. It doesn't have sentience, and that's what defines it for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about C? Max. Uh, I said C because I think that embryo has potential to become a human, and we sh like shouldn't just use it as an end to means. Mm -hmm. See it like as an end in itself. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. But you said you can use it. Um, well, yeah, but as like I said, you should take into consideration everything, including the embryo. Like, uh, how do you decide, Max? How would you decide whether or not, if I said I want to destroy a blastocyst to do stem cell research, how would you? What questions would you want to ask me to decide whether uh, it should be this research should be approved or not? What would you want to know? Well, if the benefits from destroying this blastocyst would save more people in the end. Uh -huh. Then that life sacrifice, then maybe there'd be a, like a reasonable reason. But just if there's other alternatives, I think we should do those instead of doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's weigh in from uh, Davis. Um, I kind of had the same reasoning too. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still on. It could potentially be a human being. So I feel like it deserves more respect, even if it's going to be destroyed for research. I still think that it's on its way to be human beings, so it should give more respect. Mm -hmm. okay. How does that respect in your mind manifest itself in terms of doing research with it? Well, I mean, I just I don't think you can compare um, embryos or blastocysts to um, like a blastocyst to human skin cells, you know, because they're definitely they're different, and so. I just think in terms, I mean, I don't really know in terms of like destroying it, but I just think that in general, I just think I have like a higher class or, you know, class. But, but is there anything that you would, free? is there anything that you would do or anything that you would regulate or any kind of um, procedures that you would put into place to distinguish, uh, let's say, uh, me from working with the skin cell and uh, Dr. Harada from working with the... Uh, um, the blastocyst. As long as it's being used for research purposes and has a specific reason of why we're using it, okay. 
there needs to be like, like not just because I want to destroy blobs, it's okay. the reason why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, great. So uh, let's see, how do I lose it? Oh, hi, got it. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so um, so let's right, so right, so how does that compare to other? Have you done this in other forums or other classes or taken I, a? I, I have not, but I'll tell you how I think it compares to what most Americans think in just just a couple minutes here. Um, so let's let's so here I'm going to try to map on uh, how I think your moral your your view of the moral value of an embryo uh, ought to um, given your mor your view of the moral value of the of an embryo what type of regulatory um, policy you probably would favor. Okay, so if you believe, so, uh, so, so here we got Kayla, since you're, I think you're the only one that voted A, you'll probably get picked on a lot here. Um, so here I'm going to assume that uh, because Kayla thinks that uh, it falls into category A, that thinks that they're equivalent to persons, um, that uh, Kayla probably is a supporter of the uh, Bush policy uh, on em uh, embryonic stem cell research. So. Have you talked about the, the okay. Yes. okay, so August 9th, 2001, uh, George Bush uh, issued a policy saying that there would be no uh, federal funding for uh, research using human embryonic stem cells, uh, with the exception that it would be okay to fund research on stem cell lines that had been created prior to the date of his speech but uh, not on uh, any embryonic stem cell lines created after the date of his speech. And uh, the reason for that distinction was that um, uh, sometimes called a distinction by philosophers between um, uh, beneficial and causal complicity, uh, that it's okay if somebody's already done a terrible thing and the thing's already done, then there's no reason uh, why we shouldn't at least benefit to the extent we can from that terrible thing. So if the embryos have already been destroyed, uh, we're not bringing those embryos back. So we might as well get whatever scientific value we can on them, but we're not going to promote or give anyone an incentive to destroy any new embryos, so we're not going to fund any research on embryos that's done uh, after that date. Um, now, uh, you might also, uh, Kayla, let me, let me ask you, what do you think about uh, should there be a legal prohibition, right? So um, should... Did President Bush not go far enough? Should there also be a, be a law passed Right, that actually prohibits scientists from doing research that result in the destruction of uh, embryos? No, I don't. Um, my, my stance on moral mm -hmm. issues in, in legality is that while I have my personal views, I refuse to push those on anybody else. Mm -hmm. So while I agree with no federal funding, okay. mm -hmm. because those people who agree that it's okay to destroy embryos, would that view would then be using the tax money of people mm -hmm. who think that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. I also don't think mm -hmm. that... Um, people who share my view should be able to force that on, on others as well mm -hmm. through the law. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, right, so that's, so I think um, in general it's hard, uh, it's hard to defend, I think, a distinction between, uh, this distinction in Bush's policy. That is that if you believe that, um, if you believe that destroying a blastocyst is the equivalent to murder, well, What's our position on murder? Do we say, well, we don't think it's a great idea, but you know, I'm not going to impose my viewpoint on you? Uh, no, we have laws that that prohibit murder, right? We go all out and prohibit it. And I think Bush can be, uh, I think, can be rightly criticized for if he was going to uh, take that position, um, then he should have also pushed for a law that would actually prohibit. Uh, research on human embryonic stem cells, uh, and he didn't, um, and he didn't do that. So to me, that shows an inconsistency. But that said, I think Kayla makes the best argument there is for uh, that distinction, right? Um, I think this is this is probably the only the only way uh, one can explain in sort of a consistent fashion the Bush policy, right? That that it's a it's a moral question, and. Um, uh, even though uh, President Bush didn't think we should go so far as to prohibit scientists from doing the research, if we have the federal government fund the research, then that's uh, forcing taxpayers to participate um, in something that uh, they find that at least a, s a sizable number, a substantial number, find morally repugnant. And you might consider it equivalent uh, to the Hyde Amendment, uh, which prohibits uh, federal money from being spent to fund abortions. 
right? The same sort of theory that, that even if we allow people to have abortions, uh, we don't make it illegal uh, if they, uh, if it, since a substantial number of people in this country think that abortions are uh, immoral, we shouldn't force those people to subsidize uh, behavior they think that's immoral with their tax dollars. So, so I think that is a justification. Let me just see, anybody, anyone have any other comments on that justification? What do you, what do you think about that distinction? Stephen? I think the comment about the uh, the paradox with pro not prohibiting it mm -hmm. is there's a counter argument to that because mm -hmm. President Bush also um, allowed the and funded the murder of people in war. Uh -huh. So mm -hmm. it's I mean there's kind of a dual sort of situation there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what what about those, Stephen? Specifically, Let's what stick about to the, the point stem cells? Yeah. What what about the point, Stephen, that um, the argument that uh, because a lot of people like Kayla, like President Bush, think that it's immoral that uh, it's immoral to destroy embryos, that those people shouldn't be forced to subsidize that behavior that they find immoral through their tax dollars. Is that a you think that's a a, a, um, a, a justifiable um, distinction to say why we won't fund it, but we're not going to prohibit it either? I don't think it's justifiable on their part because I don't support war, but my tax dollars go mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. do support stem cell research. Yeah, that, that's kind of um, oh, sure. Michael, you want to? Uh, uh, Michael, my uh, Michael. You, Michael. Okay. Yeah, my stance is that if you don't want your tax dollars going to stem cell research, mm -hmm. great. But every time a cure comes out for a cancer or for any mm -hmm. other disease, you also don't get to benefit from that. So mm -hmm. if you're going to refuse mm -hmm. to put your money toward the cure, mm -hmm. you then can't benefit from it, which a lot mm -hmm. of people suddenly change their mind when you can cure the cancer oh, they okay. have. Um, I agree with what Michael is saying, but um, you can't n prohibit someone from getting treatment, you know, just because they didn't pay for it. But I think that really shows, like, why you, you do need federal funding, even for mm -hmm. things that not everyone agrees with, because something like stem cell research could have really far lasting effects in the medical community that would benefit everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, I think that that is, you know, that's, uh, you know, I think Kayla made a good argument. I think Stephen makes the, um, the right response to that argument, which is, uh, you know, to generalize Stephen's point a little bit that we, you know, in a, um, if you live in a society, you know, we're, we're a collective. And, uh, the, and you know, part of the way the democratic process works is we don't get to have a veto on the use of our tax dollars for a variety of different things, right? When the, when, uh, the majority wants to do uh, X, then the rest of us have to spend our tax dollars on it. And so those of us, uh, Stephen said, you know, if you're against the war in Iraq, well, you don't get to, um, you know, we don't, we don't have the government saying, well, we're not going to spend uh, money, we're not going to spend taxpayer money on everything that some people find immoral or some people are opposed to, right? Because then we probably couldn't spend money on, on virtually anything. So I think that's, that's kind of the uh, structure of the, of the argument on this point. Um, okay, so that's, um, so let me, let me contrast this with a position of somebody who voted for B on the chart, right? So if you think that blastocysts essentially have no moral value, then uh, presumably you're in favor of no restrictions at all on uh, stem cell research, right? On, on either the practice of it by scientists or the funding by the federal government. You probably think that uh, stem cell research should be funded on the same basis as any other scientific research. That is, based on its relative scientific merit, right? If it has a lot of potential, it gets more money. If it doesn't, it gets less money. But there shouldn't be any special rules for uh, stem cells. Now, what if you're in the intermediate value uh, position, right? It's about almost a third of the people in the class uh, were. And I think this is where an awful lot of Americans uh, find themselves, um, probably more than, more than the 30 percent in this class. Well, and I also think that this is where Congress finds itself. If you look at the legislation, Congress twice, pass, tr twice tried to pass laws. Uh, both times it was called the Stem Cell Research Enhancement <coughs> Act, or SCREA for short. Uh, it was passed twice by, uh, the, by Congress and vetoed two times by President Bush, which would have essentially overridden Bush's policy on funding. It would have instructed the government to fund embryonic stem cell research. But there are some limitations. Only it would have allowed, embryo, it would have allowed research to be funded only if the embryos that were originally used to create the stem cell lines were excess embryos from in vitro fertilization. 
You could not, under SCRIA, if SCRIA had passed and become the law, the federal government would not have been allowed to fund research on embryonic stem cell lines if the embryos were created especially for stem cell research. Okay? Now, if you're going to distinguish between embryos that are created especially for stem cell research and embryos that are left over from in vitro fertilization, this is sometimes called the discarded created distinction, almost certainly you find that there's some heightened moral value of a blastocyst above, uh, you, val you think that there's more value than just a regular clump uh, of human cells. Otherwise, you wouldn't be at all concerned about how they got the, uh, the blastocyst. Um, the other reason I think that Congress falls in the middle ground, then I'll, I'll get you here in just a second, Julie. The other reason I think Congress falls in the middle ground is that every year since 1995, in an annual appropriations bill, Congress has reenacted what's called the Dickey Amendment, which uh, prohibits the federal government from funding any research that would directly destroy or create an embryo. So even if Congress had successfully overridden Bush's policy, it would have only uh, provided for funding of research on embryonic stem cell lines that were already created by somebody else who didn't get federal funding. You couldn't have used federal money, federal research support, to actually create the embryonic stem cell lines because that act destroys embryos. And the Dickey Amendment is Congress speaking now, not President Bush, but Congress speaking, prohibiting government funds for that reason. Julie? I'm going to jump in here. Kind of two parts, but was both times that SCRIA was passed, were those both after the 2006 election? Once before, once after. So, one time, so the first time there were Republican majorities in uh, Congress, the second time there were Democratic majorities. Um, the second time was really for show. Uh, the second time was right after the 2006 elections. It was one of the first things Congress did in 2007. They knew they didn't have the votes to override a veto, uh, but they passed it anyway. Kind of The Democratic Congress passed it again for a second time as kind of a political point, even though they knew that Bush would veto it and they wouldn't have the votes to override it. The first time it was passed in 2005 by the House and 2006 by the Senate, I think there was some uncertainty, right? There was hope that there might be enough bipartisan support for the bill uh, to override a veto. There wasn't, there, there wasn't that is, there wasn't a two-thirds vote you need to override the president's veto, but there was a substantial majority in both houses of Congress, even when the Republicans controlled Congress. And I think this is some reason to believe um, that the intermediate value position, I think, reflects sort of the, the, the um, uh, the consensus opinion of Americans generally. There are obviously people uh, on, both, on both extremes, but I think most Americans, as reflected by Congress, uh, really take this intermediate value position, not one of the extreme positions. Now, whoops, I'm going to come back to this in a second. So at this time, so before November 2007, when induced pluripotent stem cells were developed, the view, if you look at polls of Americans on do you favor embryonic stem cell research or do you not, you find that depending on how the question is asked, anywhere between about 50 to about 75 percent of Americans were in favor of embryonic stem cell research. I think, and um, nobody, no polls have ever tried to break down Americans into these three different views. But uh, I think what you have, base, you know, roughly speaking, you have about a third of the people uh, uh, on the left side of this chart, right? They're, they're, the, they're, the, uh, they're sort of routinely 20 to 25 percent of Americans, maybe not a third, maybe more like a quarter. However you ask the question, 20 to 25 percent of Americans are opposed to embryonic research, period. Okay? Um, about 75 percent are in favor. And I think some of those people are in the no, no moral value category, where the majority of you are, and for what it's worth, where I ha happen to be too. Um, but a lot of that two-thirds to three-quarters of Americans are really in this middle category who have the following opinion, that, yeah, we're uncomfortable about destroying embryos for research. We don't like it. We think there's something bad about it, and we're uncomfortable with it. But we're told by scientists how much potential this has for curing uh, uh, a lot of uh, very either fatal or very um, uh, or non-fatal but very bad diseases. 
Uh, and so we think it's worth it because we think that it's more important to try to help people to ha try to help people than to protect blastocysts. And uh, you know, especially the Republican supporters of stem cell research uh, almost unanimously express a view that's like this. If you look at in terms of what congressmen say, so Orrin Hatch, who's uh, you know quite um, uh, uh, quite a um, uh, uh, long-standing conservative uh, uh, opposes abortion rights but favors embryonic stem cell research and he's very um, uh, you know when he ex when he explains his position he says I think you know I do care about the blastocyst but I think that it's more important to worry about people than about blastocysts and that's what I see the trade-off as being uh, so you end up between because groups uh, uh, the middle group and the right group uh, both are favoring stem cell research, you end up with a strong social consensus in favor of stem cell research. Now, the question is, now that there are induced pluripotent stem cells, now what should your position be based on your view of the moral worth of blastocysts? So if you're on either of the extreme viewpoints, I think your view won't change at all, right? If you're like most people in this class who said you, have, you think there's no moral value to blastocysts, you say, well, my view on embryonic research is the same as it always was, right? It should be done if there's, if, there's any, if there's any scientific potential, right? If it has any scientific value, then we should do it. What do we care about blastocysts? Very different question if you're in the middle group, right? If you're in the middle group, and now we have a very different landscape, I would argue, uh, since induced pluripotent stem cells were developed. Um, there are problems with induced pluripotent, pl pluripotent stem cells. There's a problem right now with the use of retroviruses. Um, but most scientists think that that problem is going to be solved sooner or later, and probably sooner. There are already some scientists that are having success in using uh, other kinds of techniques to, instead of insert new genes into the cells, um, to uh, figure out ways to basically turn on the switches of the genes that are already in the cells that are just dormant. Um, not using uh, retroviruses or, or other things that can cause problems in the cells. So I, most scientists think we're going to be able to solve that problem. Now, there's no guarantee that induced pluripotent stem cells are going to be as good as embryonic stem cells or as useful for all possible uses. They may or may, they may not be. Probably there's going to be another five to ten years worth of research before we even know the answer to that question. We know that they are not embryonic stem cells, right? They act like embryonic stem cells, but they're not embryonic stem cells. So maybe we're going to find ways in which they don't work as well for certain purposes. But maybe not. And uh, Jamie Thompson, who uh, was the person who discovered, he was the first person to create human embryonic stem cells in 1998. And he was one of the two people that created the induced pluripotent stem cells 15 months ago. He was here at UCLA about, I don't know if you saw him, Bob, when he was here. Was it? six months ago, or I don't know. And I had a, uh, an opportunity after his talk to ask him about this, and he said, I think in five years we're not going to be using embryonic stem cells anymore. He says, uh, he, he thinks that I, iPSCs are the future and that embryonic stem cells are on their way out. Well, he'd be the first to admit he doesn't know for sure, right? Maybe, maybe not. But if you're like Max, and you take this sort of balancing position, right? We've got to balance the marginal benefits of using embryos versus the costs of using embryos. I think now you've got to think that the cost-benefit calculus has changed. Now, you might still come out with the same answer. You might still think the benefits are still worth the cost, but you might not. You might think, yeah, I was all for using embryos for research when I thought it was the only way we were going to be able to find cures for these terrible diseases, but now it looks like there's a very good chance, not perfect, not guaranteed, but there's a very good chance we can get all the benefits of embryonic stem cells without destroying any embryos. So maybe the cost-benefit calculation has changed. Um, this has not worked its way. This is too subtle to have worked its way into the general population yet. You don't see any changes yet in um, the percentage of Americans that are for or against embryonic stem cell research. Uh, but I think, that this, uh, I think that this will eventually work its way into the population. And I think you're going to see over the next few years, unless we find out there's something really bad about the induced pluripotent stem cells, something comes out. But if that doesn't happen, I think you're going to see a, a gradual decline in public support for embryo research. And it might be the reason, by the way, um, this is just guesswork on my part, but there's been, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of debate recently about why President Obama has not issued an executive order 
overturning the Bush policy yet. Um, most people thought he would do that very quickly when he, was, uh, when he took office. I expected that it might happen on the first day. You might remember him signing some executive orders, including the one that ordered the military to close down Guantanamo Bay. I, I thought he's going to close Guantanamo Bay, and he's going to overturn the Bush policy on stem cell research. He's not done that yet, and a lot of people are complaining uh, very loudly uh, to him. In fact, Diana DeGette, who is one of the sponsors, she's a congresswoman from Colorado who was one of the sponsors of the SCRIA, um, she basically cornered him when he gave his speech the other night. Uh, on the floor of the Congress when he was walking in, and, uh, I don't know if he was walking in or out, but when he was shaking hands with the various people. And she said, Mr. President, when are you going to, how come you haven't overturned the stem cell rules? When are you going to do it? And he assured her, as he's done many times in the last few weeks, when this question comes up, we're going to take care of that, don't worry. But I think that they may not be quite sure about what they're going to do. Uh, my, my, uh, my guess is, is that uh, he's going to issue an executive order eventually that looks like SCRIA, right? It's going to take this intermediate position. It's going to still um, have restrictions based on, I'm almost certain that he's going to say that the federal government will fund, uh, should fund research, but only if the embryos are leftovers from IVF clinics. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain he's going to say that. And I doubt he's going to try to do anything to overturn the Dickey Amendment uh, either. So I think we'll skirt along in that uh, intermediate value uh, position for a while. All right. Anyone else want to say anything about this? Then I'm going to think I'm done with. Uh, am I done with this topic? Just a second. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm done with this topic. Yeah, Julie. Do you think it's? Do you think it's Gria? It's Gria or something like it was passed, like a presidential. Sorry. An executive order? An executive yeah. order that that would change the Congress's attitude towards the Dickey Amendment? Um, no, um, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think it would really matter one way. I, I don't think it would really matter one way or another. I mean, to me, it was very um, surprising that when the Democrats controlled Congress after the 2006 election, that they didn't try to. Um, stop passing the Dickey Amendment. It's not something that would actually have to be repealed because it's not a law. It's, it's passed every year as part of a budget act, which means it's basically only in place for a year. But it just gets put in the budget act every year. But they didn't try to take it out. Um, so I think, um, I think even most Democrats in Congress fall into this middle position, right? That they don't feel comfortable, although most Democrats in Congress want to fund research on embryonic stem cell lines, most of them are uncomfortable with the idea of the government funding research that actually, funding the actual destruction of the embryos, the work that actually destroys the embryo in order to create the stem cell line. Uh, I mean, that's the only reason I can think of as to why there's been no, this still gets put in the act every year and there's no debate on it. Nobody brings that up for debate. Now, maybe it's because, you know, from a political calculation, maybe it's because um, Congress people don't uh, think it's worth a fight over because, quite frankly, it's pretty easy and not that expensive to create new stem cell lines now. We got lots of them. We don't really need the government to fund the creation of the cell lines. Doug Melton at Harvard, just in his one lab, has created between 50 and 100 different cell lines just in his one lab. In the, in the United Kingdom, they're creating a lot of them. Uh, that's easy, and it does, doesn't require billions of dollars of investment. Uh, it's, the, it's the research on the lines themselves, trying to understand the diseases and trying to figure out how the cell lines could be used for um, uh, treatments. Uh, that's what requires the, the funding. And so maybe it's, just, uh, maybe it's just a political calculation that we really don't want to have a big fight over embryo destruction, because that's not really what's important here. OK, uh, so let's talk about a different question. Um, so I'm going to ask you to get out the eye clicker things again. OK, so uh, just like the first question, I'm going to give you three choices of which of the following views most closely reflect your own about here about the sale of human eggs. OK, A, the law should permit women to sell their eggs to anyone that they want at whatever price the market will bear. Uh, B, the law should prohibit women from selling their eggs for any purpose. And you can vote for B whether or not you think it's OK to reimburse women for the actual expenses that they incurred, um, if there are any expenses. 
Uh, and then C, uh, the law should permit women to sell their eggs to infertile couples or individuals, infertile individuals who wish, or unmarried individuals who wish to use the eggs for fertility treatment, but prohibit such sales for the purposes of conducting biomedical research. Okay, so your three choices. There you go. Stop. Okay, stopping. <laughs> That's what I would have thought. It's exactly right. what I would have thought. Well, I don't have to spend a lot of time uh, rebutting the arguments. Huh? Um, okay. So, right, so almost everyone says uh, A. All right, B. Who said B? Max again. Max. Let me hear from you, Max. Loud and clear, okay? There you go. Okay. I said B because... Um, it's on. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, because just like organ donors, uh -huh. we, they don't pay for... We, they don't get paid for their donations when they donate their organs. And also, yep. um, like I support reimbursement for expenses. Mm -hmm. And that could include like a... Ba like a like not, not, not for like a free market type of thing, but like a a base price for any egg. Um, that way, you, like, basically, a living or, like, life wouldn't, like, basically human beings wouldn't, I mean, what if a woman wanted to just make money off selling her eggs? I mean, that's dangerous for her and for, like, uh, for her health, so I don't think that should be allowed. But, um... Max, do you think you should get paid to donate your sperm? Uh, a base price for you. Well, then what's the difference? Well, I, same thing. I mean, I they, I support. I mean, it's fun. Did you ever donate paid. your sperm? Did you vote no. when Michelle was here? No, I don't. Okay, I don't. go ahead. <laughs> well, okay, I you have don't. a good genome. You know, it might oh, be. That's uh, wonderful. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> ask him that question. I absolutely. Use that's, a, that's cool. Whatever. Anyways, but, for, why don't we go to Davis? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Faria, how did you vote? Um, I actually don't, I don't really know how I felt about all of them. So but you abstained? I, well, I mean, I, I support it for research, but I didn't really see an op, well, I don't, I actually don't know, but I support it for research, and I don't know that for a fact, so I was leaning, if I had to between all three, if I leaned more towards, I would choose A, but I don't know why, I just feel a little iffy for some reason. Who chose, um, who chose C? Rose, do you want to tell us why? Um, I chose C because I feel like it should be sort of a middle ground. Like, I would say that reimbursements for expenses should be incurred if it's for biomedical research as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I feel like it should be on the same basis, basically, as, like, sperm or donation in terms of for infertile couples. Like, men get paid for sperm donations, and I feel like egg donations are more... Um, like they're more risky, I would say, than a sperm donation is. Um, so women should definitely get paid for that. Um, so, so it sounds like you, it sounds like you think A then. I'm not sure why you voted for C. Well, they're selling their eggs to infertile couples, right? And then also, but I think that for um, biomedical research purposes, uh -huh. that it shouldn't be that you're it's you're donating it. You're not necessarily getting paid for it, except mm -hmm. for medical expenses. Uh -huh. what, what, why should women not be able to uh, get paid if, if if scientists are willing to pay them for uh, to donate eggs for research? What's wrong with that? Why are, why are you opposed to that? I'm not necessarily saying that it's wrong. I'm just saying that I feel like, I mean, if you're willing to donate your eggs for medical research, like you should be willing beyond like a price reason. Ah, okay. You should have some other reason. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, anyone else? Who else voted for C? I'm interested. Any other reasons for C? Hiromi? Hiromi. Here. <coughs> um, I just said C because I was kind of like um, back going back to the question one about like embryonic research. Mm -hmm. Like I think I didn't think like. Well, maybe I might have read the question wrong, but I, I just thought like is there should be like. Say like giving egg because, you know, to get money for, to give it to research. 
Like, I, I guess it's a similar reason to what Rose said. Uh, so, but I guess then, why don't you think, if you think that if, you, if you're willing to donate your eggs to research, you should be doing it. We only want to let people donate to research who are doing it for some reason other than money. Uh, then why wouldn't you say the same for people who donate their eggs uh, to an infertile couple? Why shouldn't we have the same requirement that we only want to allow people to do that who have a reason other than money for doing it? Why the distinction? I don't, sorry, I couldn't really understand. Why would you treat, don't, why would you treat women who want to sell their eggs for infertility treatments differently? Well, um, because when you're giving your eggs, it's like you're actually like you're gonna have an like you know you're you're actually gonna be related to that baby that's gonna be born and stuff like that. So. So it's okay to charge for that. <laughs> Fifty thousand dollars or whatever they're advertising in the Daily Bruin today, for egg donors. Eighty thousand dollars if you have really good SAT scores. I don't I don't know. Maybe her roommate will change her answer. Go ahead, All right, Eden. Eden? When you donate your body to science after you die, mm -hmm. um, your body is basically at the will of whatever the scientists want to do with it. They can decompose it or anything basically that they want to do. And so I think that maybe um, there should be some regulations on what research is done. Mm -hmm. um, Samantha told me about how at UC Irvine they had for research put the, um, made people pregnant with people's eggs without telling them and stuff. And so I think that it shouldn't just be forever, whatever research is sort of with the same Yeah, thing. okay, so, so fair enough. So, so I have, um, so implicit in, implicit in my view about this, I guess, I'm, uh, I'm assuming here that whichever uh, one of these uh, choices we make, that any egg donation is going to require a thorough informed consent procedure, right? So the person who's donating knows exactly what the eggs are being used for and also what the risks are of donation. So that's, that's kind of like a baseline. But I'm, I'm trying to assume away with this, this question, I'm trying to assume away those problems, right? That, that of course, there's the, I think almost 100% of people would agree that there is an informed consent uh, issue, right? That, that we want to make sure uh, tissue donors are well informed about um, these various things. But, but even, but, so I'm looking at the question sort of beyond, uh, beyond that. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so um, <clears throat> y y y there are a lot of arguments here. I go through them in, in more detail in the book, but I'm not going to talk about, about all of them here. But let me just hit on a couple of the big ones about generally the question of selling, selling tissues generally and selling eggs in particular. So the arguments for compensation are this is you know, how you enable the market to clear and you avoid, avoid shortages. That uh, if you think that either... IVF treatment for people who are infertile or biomedical research to try to find cures for diseases are important, but you don't allow women to be paid, then you're probably not going to have enough women who are going to donate. And in fact, this has been uh, demonstrated quite conclusively in a lot of, uh, in a lot of forums. Um, so uh, a stem cell researcher that I know at Harvard named Kevin Egan, he spent about a year going around telling the story about how his lab at Harvard spent $100,000 ad advertising for egg donors. But under Massachusetts law, which I'll talk about in a minute, they're not allowed to pay any egg donors. Um, so they got lots of calls, right? Lots of people saw the eggs and they called up and expressed an interest. But then when they were told about the, um, the burdens involved. Egg, I'm sure you talked about this last week when you talked about it. Egg donation is not an easy process, right? You have to have a lot of, a lot of hormone shots. It's very uncomfortable. There are a lot of trip to the, trips to the doctor. Um, there's uh, you know, a, a, a non-trivial invasive procedure to get the eggs out. And there is a small but a very real risk of some uh, very serious uh, medical consequences. Um, so when people find out about all this and they find out that they're also not going to be paid, then after $100,000 in a year, they had actually netted zero volunteers. No one signed up. Now, I've since heard through the grapevine that now they've updated that research. Now the number is one. They, they, they actually now claim that they've gotten one volunteer. But you're not going to get very many um, volunteers. This is also why there's no shortage in the United States for in vitro fertilization. Um, uh, because we allow eggs to be sold for fertilization purposes, uh, whereas in England there is a very uh, serious shortage of eggs because there are limits placed on, um, 
on compensation there. Okay? So if you think that these uses are necessary and you want the market to clear, then you have to allow the market to work. Um, and then from the other side, there's an argument, there's an autonomy argument for women, uh, uh, right, that it protects the decisional autonomy of the donors. Who are we to tell individual women what they can and can't do uh, with their bodies? And if they think that, um, you know, that, that uh, the burdens of, of, uh, of donating eggs are outweighed by the benefits of the money that they can earn by doing so, um, who are any of us to tell uh, women that they can't do that, provided that there's appropriate informed consent, right? Provided that there's education about the, the burdens and the risks that are involved. Um, on the other side, the two primary arguments on the other side, and again, there are other arguments, but I'm just going to talk about the two. Um, the, the, the primary one here is that payment undermines voluntariness of donation, the idea of coercion, that especially uh, women who don't have a lot of money, right, poor women, are going to feel coerced, that they're going to feel like they have no choice but to uh, donate their eggs if they're in you know, uh, uh, bad financial circumstances and there's a lot of money to be had by being an egg donor. Right? The, um, uh, and, and by the way, I have to say that I am, I, I am always shocked personally by how many um, uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise very liberal, otherwise very uh, people that would call themselves uh, dyed in the wool feminists adopt this position um, that, uh, that it's coercive to offer women money for their eggs. Um, so the problems that I think with this argument, I kind of made a cottage industry about arguing uh, against uh, this argument for a little while, um, is that um, it, it really is, is in a sense nonsensical in a free market society. If we believe and we run our society on market and capitalist principles, to say that payment undermines free will is inconsistent with the whole way we operate our society. Um, am I, I would not be teaching at UCLA Law School if I had to do it for free. Does that mean I'm being coerced? Right? You know, that I'm only doing, you know, if they, don't, if they stop paying me, I stop teaching. So does that mean I'm really, am I being coerced? Is it not, is it not a voluntary decision on my part? You know, if you guys um, do your, uh, take an exam, right, do you feel like you're being coerced? Because if you don't take the exam, Bob's not going to pass you probably in the class, right? So is that, is that coercion? Sort of everything we do in a market society, there's, there's uh, you know, some consideration uh, on both sides. So uh, it's hard to know where the line is if, uh, if you take that uh, position. Now, um, <clears throat> The other problem with this argument, I think, a, sort of a response to the first argument I made here is that, is that no, egg donation is different because we're afraid that women might, we're particularly afraid that women might make bad decisions in this context because there's a lot of risk, it's, there's a lot of discomfort, and there's a lot of risk involved, and we're afraid that if people are waving money in front of their faces, women are not going to make very rational, well-considered decisions in this particular situation as different from all the other market transactions we enter into. This particular one, there's a particular danger. But I think the problem with this argument is that if paternalistic protection is necessary in this context, it seems like it should also be necessary for altruists. If it's too dangerous for people to do it for money, why is it not too dangerous for people who are willing to do it for free? Right? So, so I think that in order to be um, consistent, You'd have to take the position not that people can donate for free, but that we won't allow women to donate their eggs at all. Because whatever benefits there are to be had, we just don't think it's worth the potential health consequences to the donors. Um, uh, and then the other, so one other argument here is that I think r that risk of true coercion is minimized if there aren't shortages in the following sense. Here's where I fear coercion. I fear coercion where, uh, of uh, women who have relatives with diseases that might benefit from stem cell research. They feel a lot of pressure to do something to help their relatives. And they hear Kevin Egan talking about how they want to do this life-saving research at Harvard, but they can't get any donors. Right? Um, 
I fear the, co the subtle coercion of people who feel like they, women who feel like they have no choice because the well-being of their relatives uh, depends on donations. And that type of coercion is only possible if there's a shortage, right? If we let the market clear, if we let people who are willing to sell their eggs sell their eggs, then we don't have to worry about, uh, about that type of coercion. Okay, the... Um, uh, oh, and, and, then I think, uh, and then I think generally it, that the problem with this argument is that it, it reflects a kind of wishful thinking that, um, uh, that we shouldn't have scarcity and nobody should have to make hard choices. And often you hear somebody say, um, well, women who are really poor and they need money to buy food for their families or to buy shelter or to buy other basic necessities of life, they shouldn't have to sell their eggs in order to have those things. They should be able to get those things without selling their eggs. To which my response is, yes, that may be right, but that's not the question, right? There's still going to be scarcity. Uh, that's, not, that's not the alternative world, right? It's not the alternative world where all poor women who might be, uh, feel like they would want to sell their eggs for money would be given so much money by the government or by somebody else Bill Gates, I don't know who's going to give it to them. Uh, all poor people are going to be given so much money that no one would want to sell their eggs. Okay? That's, not the, uh, that's not the alternative world right? that we're uh, choosing between. That's just uh, wishful thinking.